Welcome to the Going North Podcast, where you will be informed, encouraged, and empowered to embrace your dreams and advance in life through authorship. I'm your host, best-selling author of the book, Stay the Course, and certified leadership trainer, Don Brightman. Be sure to check out the goods and services from every guest, as well as the host himself, yours truly. Now let the fun begin. And today on the Highlight Reel Builder for Authors, GMP the Great Glory saying Glamorous, as you all know and love, the Going North Podcast. And it's a host to host special because in the words of one of my favorite video game characters, it's Big Smoke, it's time to return to favor, baby. Because my goodness, this lovely lady right here had me on her wonderful show, The Edges of Lean. A few weeks ago in the mighty year of 2021 where the Millennium decided to drink even more out of the darn keg. And my goodness, she is one heck of a super special awesome human. Let me tell you a little bit about her. She's a certified professional coach and lead consultant at Lean for Humans Incorporated, which blends lean business improvement and creativity, helping organizations and individuals achieve innovative results. And the super special awesome lady right here was trained as a scientist, so she's excited about scientific thinking in all environments. You heard that right, folks. So there's penguins and squirrels playing together, that environment too, y'all. And she's also about mixing in creativity to drive innovation. And before starting her own company back in 2018, she was a process excellence leader at J&J, focusing on bringing continuous improvement and lean thinking to the pharmaceutical and the medical device R&D sectors. So let's give it up for the super special awesome, the beautiful and excellent Bella Engelbach. How you doing today, Bella? After that intro, I'm just doing great. Thank you so much. Oh, uh, yeah, that's right. This is usually the best part of the show before the rabbit holes appear. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Well, no matter how good introductions are, they're usually not allowed to be 71 days long. So mind filling in any dental cavities I may have missed about you, Bella? Uh, yeah, there's a couple things. And that is actually one of the reasons that I'm excited to talk to you and, and connect with your audience today. And that is that I wrote a book. And the book um, is something that the process of writing the book was something that was a really huge learning experience for me. So I really want to share that with people. And I guess a couple of the things about me, I have uh, a rescue beagle right now, and I am learning to train this dog using games, which is a really different approach to dog training. And now I'm excited to think about well, how might we do that with people? What games could we play? Um, so stay t- stay tuned. I'm thinking about that. How do we how do we uh, get ourselves educated by playing games instead of studying books? So thinking about that too. Yeah, uh, there we go. Some beagle weagles. That's what I'm talking about. Indeed, that's right. That's right. The gamification got a freaking love it. So my goodness. So with all of this wonderful theme of lean like my goodness it's like it's not about even dieting too as the corny joke <laughs> it is <laughs> not about of... <laughs> dieting and it's not about it's not about as some people say people think that lean means less employees are needed because i know a lot of people talk about <laughs> lean and mean right you know we, we're gonna, gonna make the company lean and mean so we're gonna fire people that's you know that's really not what, what lean is about so it's 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 about You know, everybody has problems, right? Everybody has a problem, whether, you know, it's in their personal life or in their organization. And it's about, well, how do we just solve the problems in the most effective way? And you have to start by seeing the problems and really getting clear about what the problems are. Well, you know, which sounds simple, but it's kind of super hard when you really get down to it. So that's what uh, Lean is. It's, It's helped a lot of organizations become very effective, become very efficient. And I think the most important part has helped them develop their employees to be superb problem solvers who can then take that skill home to their families, to their personal life. And that's what I like about it. Yeah. So, and I know a lot of companies are doing things, you know, now they're they're talking about continuous improvement. They're talking about lean. They're talking 
about Six Sigma, so it's out there everywhere. But I know it, and I know it always feels like, oh, it doesn't always feel, but it often feels like it's just another program that they're asking you to do. You know, is that there's another program. It's another flavor of the week thing we got to do now. We got to do lean. But if you really kind of bring it into your life, it can make a huge difference to everything. And um, gosh, Dom, I hate to tell you this, they are mowing the lawn right outside my house. So hopefully that's not getting picked up. Yeah, the joys of podcasting. Gotta love it. That's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, put, I put up a podcast a couple of weeks ago with the dog barking right in the middle of it. We couldn't edit it out. It was really just that was the way it was. Yeah, but hey, such is life, such is life indeed. So my goodness, you were always this wonderful, bright young lady, really applying scientific thinking to basically everything you do. So what led you up to that point? Did you grow up with thinking like, hey, you know what? I'm going to grow up and be a freaking consultant. Like I'm going to make things explode in business. Who the who in the world grows up and says, I want to grow up and be a consultant? I mean, if you find that person, I want to meet them. I, I haven't met them yet. <laughs> I started out when I was little, when I was really little, I wanted to be a doctor because I thought, you know, I thought that was kind of cool. Um, and people said to me, because I was a little girl, they said, oh, you should be a nurse. I said, no, I, I want to be a doctor. And then that kind of revolved into, I want to be a scientist. I, I, I want to, and, and I had a wonderful science teacher in seventh grade, um, a guy named Joe Hampel. I give a shout out to him. He's still a friend of mine. And, and Joe was from Maine and he, and he put his R on the end of all these words and he called me Bellerer, um, which was hilarious, but he was right out of school at the first couple of years teaching. And he got me super excited about science and, and what scientists did and how they did it and learning about the natural world. And then the other thing that really excited me, and this will kind of tell you like how old I really am, was, the, was Jacques Cousteau on the TV. So there were all these Jacques Cousteau TV specials about oceanography and marine biology. And I was like, wow, that is what I want to do. So I actually um, went to college to study marine biology. Now, funny thing happened in college, you know, lots of funny things happened in college. And one of the things that happened was in order to earn a degree in marine biology at the school I went to, you had to take two courses in invertebrate zoology. So invertebrate zoology means all of the animals, knowing all about all of the animals that don't have backbones. So like bugs, worms, jellyfish, you know, sea slugs, you name it, if it doesn't have a back backbone, that's an invertebrate. And there are way more invertebrates in the world than there are vertebrates that are creatures that have backbones, right? I had to, I had to pass two invertebrate zoology classes. And part of that invertebrate zoology class was you had to be able to tell one worm from another. And like, so we'd be looking at these like worms in the lab or looking at pictures of worms. Dumb, I could not distinguish one worm from another. To me, they had, like there were worms, you know? I couldn't tell the difference between worm, worm and another. So I know I couldn't face another invertebrate zoology class. So I switched my major to general biology, which was actually probably a good thing. And from there, I went into working in academic research at a university here near where I live and then went into the pharmaceutical industry. And then somewhere along the way, um, and that's another long story which people don't need to hear, I started to not just do the science, but also to write about it. I had a couple of wonderful bosses and mentors who encouraged me to write papers, to present the papers. And so I started writing that led it into a career of doing medical writing. And from medical writing, I actually, Another long story found my way into consulting. So that was how um, I ended, I, part of the story of how I ended up doing what I'm doing, but it really was about that first passion about, about science. And I still remember Joe Hample, Mr. Hample saying, science is the search for knowledge. And I can remember thinking, that is just the coolest thing ever. Like, it's the search for knowledge. Who doesn't love knowledge? So that was, that was how I got into it. And I'm still like, Dance around the edges there. And the thing that really excites me is this idea that with science, we can solve problems. Once we get out of a lab, we stop thinking like scientists. So, 
you can have a scientist who's doing beautiful, elegant experiments in a lab. You take them out of the lab and give them a different kind of project to do. And what happens? They stop thinking like a scientist. They think, if I do this, this other thing will happen. There will be a consequence with no evidence of why that will happen other than they thought that's the way it was going to be. And then they find out, you know, then they're wrong. And then, you know, then they feel like a failure. And this happens over and over in business. We plan things. We expect things to happen through some kind of magic. Um, they don't happen the way we expect it because there are factors we didn't understand. And then, you know, we say that, uh, you know, our improvement project was a failure. We say our, our marketing project was a failure. All of these things were failures. Well, it was just, you know, it's partly because we didn't actually think like scientists when we were doing them. You know, we, we, we started to think like two-year-olds who have magical thinking. And I, you know, I see it over and over and over again. You know, it's kind of this, we're going we're gonna to do this part and then the magical end's going to happen. Well, it doesn't sometimes. So. <laughs> so that's why I think, you know, if we, if we can be, get better at thinking like a scientist in a lab, and understand science, we're going to have to do some little experiments before we do a big experiment, um, we're going to be a lot better off. Um, yeah, so that's, uh, that's, that's, it. that's kind of it in a nutshell, but then something else happened. I'll tell you, this. so the other thing that happened is, which is about how I came to write the book. I was also, because I was working in a pharmaceutical company, where, you know, pharma companies are super interested in innovation. So we had this innovation program going on. So I was letting about creative problem solving and how to, you know, how people come up with ideas and how you move ideas forward. And I always want things to work together. I put it, and so I was really struggling with, well, how does creative problem solving work with essentially scientific thinking? And obviously do they do because so much of our innovation comes out of science. They do work together, but it was kind of like people were arguing about it where you can't do this thing. You can't be creative and also think scientifically, like it, they didn't work together. And I thought, well, they had, you know, they do work together. We know we see a lot of evidence in the world that they do work together. So um, that was really where I, I, I took my practice was thinking about how do we move lean, what, lean thinking, which is scientific thinking and creative problem solving. How do we identify how to do them better together so we can be creative and we can be effective, we can be efficient and we can um, actually complete our projects. Um, so that was how I ended up writing my book was was wanting to get that idea down on paper. Uh, there you go. There you go. Get it down on paper, indeed. And I love the fact that science is really just a search for knowledge. So I guess that really applies to business in multiple ways, because at the end of the day, you got to every now and then, if not constantly search for new knowledge while making sure that you keep the lights on in the process because things keep changing constantly nowadays even faster now than ever yeah you are so right dom i mean and, and that's that is like one of the biggest problems that we have as human beings right now is that you know there's a lot of change right and so we have to be constantly evaluating the things that we think we know because maybe they don't apply anymore but on the other hand, we can't totally devalue the things that we think we know because they might still be true. So we're, we're still, we're always going to have to test things and experiment and say, does this still work? Is this still useful? Because if it's useful, we can save time and money by using something, doing something that worked before. But if it doesn't work anymore, we better stop doing it pretty quickly, right? So always having this idea that even if I think I know that this works, I should probably experiment with it right now to see what the conditions are like right now. I think that's a really valuable idea. So yeah, so you know, like be on top of the change, but make sure that you're, you're reusing what you can reuse because we don't have time to reinvent everything. It's, it's, uh... <laughs> that's so darn true. We really don't have time to reinvent everything because innovation is gonna really force you to have to innovate anyway with everything exactly that's going on. yeah everything that's going on around you things are changing yeah yeah 
Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. So, my goodness, this wonderful book here with all the knowledge and the research originally thinking you're going to grow up to be a doctor and then go into marine biology. And I was like, crap, these worms. Like, I did not realize that to learn about raising worms today and knowing the difference <laughs> between them all the way to now where you're consulting businesses and individuals. That's one heck of a journey. And it's far from over yet. So with this book, what was probably the most challenging thing about writing it, even though you really have a background in writing, especially in the medical field? That was the challenge, Dom. That was the big challenge because I had been writing. I've written a lot of stuff in my career for work. I wrote, I wrote, you know, scientific articles. I wrote write-ups of clinical trials. I wrote documents to send to the FDA. Once I got into more of the consulting side, I wrote standard operating procedures and I wrote training manuals and I wrote, you know, emails and memos and the kind of stuff you write when you're in business. So I had learned to write in a very scientific, non-personal way. And that was, is actually the kind of writing that I kind of prefer to read, to tell you the truth. So if, I, if you're going to teach me how to do something, Dom, I like to get the instructions. Just tell me the instructions. Tell me what to do. Don't tell me your story of how you got to writing those instructions. Like, you know what I hate? I hate those recipes that, you know, you go get a recipe um, off the internet. And it's a great recipe. You've got to stroll through the, uh, the author's whole life story of how <laughs> their grandmother first made their re this recipe and they, you know, and their family loves it and they can't get this ingredient anymore. So they substitute that ingredient. And it's like, can I just have the recipe, please? So, you know, that's my personal preference. So for me, the biggest challenge in writing the book was finding the right voice to write it in because I know how to write, right? I, I know how to, if I have to produce words on paper, I can sit down and put words on paper and I can edit very well, pretty well. I've been an editor in my past life as well. So I've edited other people's work extensively. I know something about grammar. You know, I, I know, you know, I could get into a debate about Harvard commas. What I really <laughs> had a hard time doing was speaking in my own voice. So, one of the, fun, for the funny things that happens when you're a coach, and it's a little weird, is that people will say to you after you've been coaching them a while, so they say, I was going to do this thing, and then I heard your voice in my head, and it made me question what I was going to do, and so I did something different instead. And, you know, so kind of, and that's a weird thing that happens when you're a coach. It's a massive compliment when you're a coach to hear that from a client. And so I had to figure out how do I get that voice on paper? Because that was, that was not what I was used to doing. Uh, but I had a secret weapon. I had a lovely writing partner, a guy named Doug Reed. He's a creative problem solving expert. So he was also the person who helped me make sure that the creative problem solving stuff I put in the book was accurate and correct. And, and I was saying that saying things in the right way. And Doug and I kind of worked as partners. Uh, Doug would um, and I would get together. We'd talk about what might be in a certain chapter. I would go write the chapter, come back, and then he would talk. And always um, when I asked him for feedback, after he asked me what I liked about it, what I thought was good about it, he would say to me whether or not he thought he was hearing enough of my voice, that voice that ends up unfortunately or fortunately in my client's head, if that was <laughs> getting on the paper. And that was very hard for me uh, when I started. And the other thing that was really hard was that I wanted to write an instruction book. If you're going to combine lean thinking, which is scientific thinking, and creative problem solving, then I will give you the instructions. Here's the recipe, guys. Here's the recipe. You know, so for people like Bella who just want the recipe, here's the recipe. And what Doug said was, you know what? That is not going to be compelling to people. That's not going to convince people that it's the right thing to do. What's going to convince them is hearing a story in your own words. So what I ended up doing, and nobody was more surprised than me, was I actually wrote a business novel. I wrote a novel about 
a middle manager in a company who was put in the horrifying position of having to learn lean thinking and creative problem solving at the same time from two different coaches who don't always agree with each other. <laughs> And at the same time, she's dealing with problems in her organization that she has to solve. She's got a, she's got the kind of manager who's like, here, get this done. I'll support you. But then, you know, goes off on a business trip and she has employees who are looking for her support and her help. And I think that that's a position that a lot of people find themselves in. That's the other thing. I see a lot of books that are kind of written for CEOs, right? Um, I'm a CEO, right? Because because I have my own company. I'm the CEO of me. But most people in the workplace are not a CEO. Most people in the workplace are either doing the work or they're in some kind of middle management position. And so that was a, that was the other thing is I really wanted to write in the voice that that voice of somebody who is kind of crushed in the middle between senior management and their employees and how do they help you know navigate being in the middle management position so so i wrote this the book the book is called creatively lean how to get out of your own way and drive innovation throughout your organization and it's a business novel about a, this woman named beth who is facing all of these problems and have the things that she learns as she's being taught about creative problem solving and about lean thinking help her to solve those problems but also um, help her to become you know lead a, a happier life but I gotta tell you at the end I couldn't resist there are some appendices there's a bunch of appendices um, and a couple of them are just those instructions so if you're somebody who wants to learn about this stuff thinks it would help you in business you don't have to read the whole story of Beth even though I think it's a neat story you can actually skip to the end and get the instructions. So I put them both in the book for, for both kinds of people. But that was the hardest thing for me was, was not writing recipes when I needed to tell a story. So um, I have to tell you also, so how did I write a lot of this book? I wrote this book while I was walking my dog. And that's going to sound really weird. But this is what would happen is I would think about, well, here's a, you know, here's a point in the book. I need to, I need to kind of play out some conversations that would be happening at the time that this thing is happening in the story. So I think my neighbors thought I was crazy. So I'd be out walking with my dog, sometimes one dog, sometimes two dogs by myself. And I would actually play these scenes out in my head. And I would actually sometimes speak the dialogue out loud, kind of in the voice of, you know, of Beth or her boss or one of her employees. So I could kind of get it into, into everyday natural language. And then I would quickly run home, sit down and start typing up what I had written. So I, again, I think some of my neighbors thought that I was a completely crazy dog lady out there, you know, talking to myself, but I was actually doing serious work writing the book. So I highly recommend getting a dog and going for a walk if you're struggling with your writing, um, as long as you have neighbors who are not going to take you, and get you, lock you up for doing that. But you know what, and, and Don, we were talking about, we were talking about this, we've, we've talked about this before. What works for me may not be what works for you. You're trying to get words on paper, my getting outside and walking the dog and talking to myself, that might be just the tip that's going to put you over the edge of getting past the writer's block and getting the words on paper. But somebody else, it might not work at all. And that is kind of like the beauty of human beings. We're all different. But I would encourage you, if like if you're stuck on something, run one experiment. If you don't have a dog, you don't need a dog, right? You can walk to the bus stop. Yeah, you can you can walk to you know you can walk in the park you don't have to talk out loud it helps but um, you know run an experiment see if being outside while you were thinking about what you want to write helps if it does thanks and i hope you have my voice in your head and if it doesn't you know you've run that experiment go try another one. Oh yeah that's right I gotta run those experiments and i'm at the point now where it's like you know what those who get mad at people that talk to themselves, well, hey, or look at them strange, boy, they need to get over themselves because at the end of the day, we all talk to ourselves every day. It's just not a lot of people do it aloud around other people. We do it to ourselves. And it's like, hey, if someone has the courage to do it aloud, then that shows that they're highly creative. In fact, there's even a couple of articles that show that, hey, folks that talk aloud to themselves, like, hey, they're actually more 
creative and they have brighter minds because they have so much going on in their head. It has to come out somewhere. So that's the reason why. And hence, you get a book out of it. So it's a freaking bonus. Yeah, so that's your tip for the day. Talk to yourself. And you know right. what? If, if you're worried about somebody thinking you, you're crazy, just put a Bluetooth um, uh, earpod in your ear and some, they'll think you're on the phone. So That's right. Only if they see it, though. That's the thing. If you got long yeah. hair and it's covering a game over, they're still going to think, oh, <laughs> crazy. All right. All right. Long hair, ponytail, earbud. You're good. <laughs> <laughs> Run the experiment. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, indeed. That's right, indeed. So, since this is far from your first rodeo on the guest side of the game on these podcasts, is there a question that you wish you would be asked more often? Oh, wow. Is there a question I wish would be asked more often? I wish that hosts would... Actually, it's not a question. I wish that hosts would say, what is the tip that they've picked up from talking to their guests? This is actually a tip that I pick. I'm in a podcasters, um, we, a little group of podcasters together. And this is one of the, the tips that somebody gave me is, is if, if you found something was really cool, tell your audience you thought it was really cool. And it's such, um, it's such a positive experience for the guest to, you know, to hear, oh, you said this, that's awesome. So I wish I wish more podcasters would do that, um, and I've I've only just learned to do it. So, you know, um, but really, that's what I wish. As far as questions, I don't I don't know that I have a particular question. Um, I like Jeopardy questions. I was on a podcast once. I got to play Jeopardy for a few minutes. That was a lot of fun. But that was a different. Oh wow! Podcast. Yeah. <laughs> okay, what's the name of this podcast? And are they still around? I wonder. Oh uh, yeah, I can, you know what? I can send you. I can send you the link to it. I have the link um, somewhere. It's a it's a marketing podcast, believe it or not. So, yeah. ah, okay, yeah, yeah. Marketers like to. Well, never mind. Let me not say that. <laughs> <laughs> I probably uh, say that. Never mind. <laughs> but hey. Here's a, no, here's a random question you probably haven't got yet. So if your wonderful book, Creatively Lean, was a food item since books are food for the mind, what would it be and why? Ooh. It would be... It would be a layer cake. Because it should leave you happy and with a good feeling, but you got to dig in and see all the different layers to really get all the benefit out of it. So it's got several layers. It's got vanilla, chocolate, it's got some raspberry jam in there. It's got uh, it's got sprinkles on top. Ah, uh, do love me some sprinkles, especially on some cupcakes. Yes, right. <laughs> <laughs> but, and I don't mean to say, I don't mean to say that it's dessert and you can skip dessert. <laughs> 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 Maybe it's lasagna. You gotta, you gotta eat your, your, your main course. Yeah, Lay, layers. It's got layers in it. Yeah. And uh, my listeners are super special, lost. They're like, now nah, I'm gonna eat my dessert first. Forget y'all. That's right. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Eat dessert. Have first. your dessert now. That's right. Before you can't have it later. I'm telling you, it's good stuff and tea. That's right. That's right. So there you go. Creatively lean is a layer cake. That's right. Yes. Yeah. That's it right. is. That's right. Extra tasty indeed. So do you feel like you're going to write another book in the future now that you got this one out the way? Yes. I, I have uh, an idea for a book. It's about lean and spirituality. So which sounds like another strange combination. You know, I started writing about lean and creativity. That, you know, people are like, what? But I have observed a lot of people who are really practicing lean thinking and particularly focusing on what we call the respect for people side of lean thinking have a spiritual component to how they talk about it. And I would I really want to do a book that I think would be more of a series of essays, perhaps by by other people, perhaps to edit this book about how their lean work, the 
lean thinking work or their creativity work, how that is aligned with or not with their own spirituality. And it doesn't matter whether, you know, what religion they are, Christian, Jewish, Buddhist, agnostic, you know, Wiccan, you know, whatever the particular jam is, uh, but how does it align? Because I think there's a lot of alignment there. There's a lot in there about how lean thinking where you're really, really focusing on solving problems that are hurting people and really focusing on respect for people, which means that you just think human beings are totally amazing and you treat them as if they're totally amazing. As you do, Dom, that's the way you treat people, that that is restorative to our souls and, and helps to restore the universe to what it should be. So that's the book I'm cooking in my head right now and um, getting ready to put out um, some calls and feelers and see who would like to write an essay or be interviewed because I could take an interview and turn it into an essay or write a poem or um, perhaps create a devotion that could go into that book. So that's the book I'm thinking of, of next. Oh, all right, cool. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. I'm excited for that one. Definitely got to have you back on the show with that book finally makes his magical debut into the world because yeah like a lot of folks they have found spirituality especially in these past couple years it's like at the end of the day i feel like a lot of humans are born spiritual they just have to discover what flavor they're going to choose to make part of their life because even (laughs) funny enough even on a podcast yesterday i was talking about how even though (laughs) some folks may be at funny enough i think even a past guess i think I forgot his name is the fact that a lot of folks may become atheists nowadays like oh we see the church on the tv and these hymns in the pulpits and whatnot sex in the pulpit and it's like i'll trust these spiritual people and they go on this wonderful excursion this journey and some may even take drugs like ayahuasca and then they find out wow all right like things have changed like there's something bigger out there for me like it's like i can't deny that there's something big out there so i feel like we're Mm -hmm. all definitely spiritual and it definitely does pay off to acknowledge that peace even though folks may be like oh my goodness like no don't bring religion to here (laughs) even though in the u.s today it's probably hey don't bring politics to anything it's probably more dangerous than religion at this point (laughs) oh yeah yeah, and, and that, that actually is impacts our, our ability to have any conversations, right? We can't have good conversations because we got to, you know, we got to avoid religion, we got to avoid politics, and yeah, that's a whole other, that's a whole other discussion for sure. That's right indeed, that's right indeed. Sweet. So we're coming down to the magical question that every guest gets to receive. And that is if you're going to wake up tomorrow and you're 25 again, but this time in the current year of 2021, with all of your knowledge and experience, what advice would you give to yourself? I would say never stop exploring. And even if you are feeling like your life is totally limited, it's not just there's more out there. There are more things to do. The career that you think you started with, look at me, the, you know, the career that you think you were going to start with may or may not be the career you end up with. Just keep exploring and just keep love in your life, right? So if you, if you keep those, if you keep exploring, focus on love, be great. Oh, yes, right. Focus on the love. <laughs> and That's and right. buy Apple. <laughs> buy Apple stock. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Buy some Granny Smith apples. That's right. That green apple right there. That's right. Buy the whole apple cart. That's right. Don't turn it over. Just buy the whole cart. That's right. Yeah. That's right. The whole yeah. cart. That's right. Add to the cart, too, when you buy the whole cart. <laughs> <laughs> So speaking of adding to cart for folks who need to add your wonderful book, maybe one or 100 copies to the cart to buy, what's the best way for folks to do so and keep up with all the stuff that you're doing in the world? If you go to my website, leanforhumans.com, I have an offer on the website for the book where I will send you a signed copy. 
um, if you buy it directly from me, or you can get it from on Amazon. And again, it's called Creatively Lean, uh, how to get out of your own way and drive innovation throughout your organization. And I can guarantee you I'm the only author named Bella Engelbach on Amazon. No one ever can, confuses me with, with any other author. But my website is leanforhumans.com. And there you can also find my podcast, The Edges of Lean, where we talk about all the things that uh, on all the places where leaders practice. Woohoo! Well, there you have it, folks. Be sure to check out Bella's site, buy some copies of the book, especially the autographed copies, indeed. That's right. So that way, in 20 years, you can sell it back to her for $100, y'all. I'm telling you. <laughs> That's right. And be sure to check out her podcast as well, since she's also a fellow bookcaster, y'all, indeed. That's right, indeed. So check it out like a library book. Check it out like 30 library books, y'all. I'm telling you some good stuff. I'm not just saying that because I was on it, because it's freaking awesome, indeed. That's lean, y'all. That's right. It's like the edge of the bedside, but it's a lean bedside, y'all. I'm telling you. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Well, before I go any deeper into more rabbit holes, any parting words before we close up shop, Bella? Do the experiment. That's my, those are my parting words. Do the experiment. This is your host, Don Braben. Hope you enjoyed what you just heard. And if you really did, do me a solid and leave a review if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, on YouTube, wherever you're listening to. And subscribe to hear more because more is coming your way to advance you further than before.